Hello, everyone, and welcome to Time Smart, how to reclaim your time and live a happier life with Ashley Willens. I have just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get underway. Feel free to use the chat box to check in from wherever you are in the world and use our Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for any questions that you wish to pose during today's recorded presentation. My name is Jill Felicio, and I'm a member of Harvard's class of 2000 and 2013, as well as the Director of Advancement at Harvard's Division of Continuing Education. I am delighted to welcome you today for such an important presentation. We are thrilled to have attendees tuning in from six continents and over three dozen US states. In my role at Harvard, I am privileged to work with the Harvard Extension Alumni Association Board of Directors and several hundred exceptional volunteer leaders from around the world to create professional, social, and learning opportunities for our 30,000 plus global community members. In fact, today's event was conceived by our exceptional alumni leadership of the Harvard Extension Alumni Association's New York City chapter. Thank you all for this fabulous idea. This event is one in a series of virtual events that we are running throughout the year to bring you topics that are relevant to the day and hopefully enriching for you both personally and professionally. Now, Ashley Willens is an assistant professor in the negotiation, organizations, and markets unit of Harvard Business School. Broadly, she studies how people navigate trade-offs between time and money. In both 2015 and 2018, she was named a rising star of behavioral science by the International Behavioral Exchange and the Behavioral Science and Policy Association. In 2016, she co-founded the Department of Behavioral Science in the Policy, Innovation, and Engagement Division of the British Columbia Public Service. Her research has been published in numerous academic journals and popular media outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. Her first book, Time Smart, How to Reclaim Your Time and Live a Happier Life, was published in October of 2020 and is currently available for purchase on Amazon. Time Smart is Amazon's number one time management and business new release. It was also named a top 10 business book by the Globe and Mail in December of 2020. I personally could not recommend it more and it is a fabulous read. And it is our honor to have Professor Willens with us today. So without further ado, please welcome Ashley. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm pleased to be speaking about my book, Time Smart, and all the research underlying it. It's great to see so many people from all over the world today. I think that's been one of the silver linings of the moment that we find ourselves in. So to start off my talk today, I want everyone to think about what comes to mind for them, what images, experiences, and activities come to mind when you think about time. You could put it in the chat window if you feel so inclined. <laughs> and so I see that some of uh, you are, are putting positive experiences. I think I, I saw a few of those. Uh, we see that time is the most precious resource that we have available to us. And family time, spending quality time with people we care about is certainly a worthwhile experience of time and something that comes to mind for us. We might also think about volunteering or visiting landmarks in cities uh, that we love and remind us of nostalgic times in our lives. However, like many of you also indicated in the chat window, time is often synonymous with stress. In fact, in my data, over 80% of working Americans report feeling time poor, like they have too many things to do and not enough time in the day to do them. And this isn't a distinctly you, you American phenomena. In globally representative data, we see similar trends whereby most working adults feel overwhelmed by the demands of work and life. Time poverty matters, not surprisingly, because it undermines our happiness. People who feel time poor, which is most of us, report feeling higher levels of stress, less happiness, lower quality social relationships, and even worse physical health. If we don't have a lot of time, it's harder to 
do activities like go outside or engage in physical activity or cook healthy meals, given we are so time demand, uh, so time stressed by the demands of everyday life. And this is consistent with the glowing, growing trend suggesting in our Gallup World Poll data that as countries have gotten wealthier, in fact, they have not gotten less stress, they've gotten more stressed. In the US since 2008, stress has risen from 44% to 55%. And these data were conducted pre-pandemic. What we've been observing in our data is that these feelings of time stress have become even more pervasive. In a globally representative sample of 3.1 million remote employees using Microsoft Analytics data, my colleagues found that the workday has increased about an hour or the time that we used to spend commuting to the office for employees all over the world. This increased work hour, um, these increased work hours rather, are driven by increased emails happening at all times of the day and night and increased meetings. Every conversation in the more virtual environment that we find ourselves in can't happen in a hallway it has to happen over email or via phone calls. And so we're having more meetings than ever before. In some survey data that I conducted with my collaborators in 44 states and 88 countries, we find that this increased technological distraction is increasing the amount of time that we are all spending in unproductive activities and making us feel like we have less time available for more productive activities. You can also see from this graph, there's been slight increases during COVID in the amount of time that we're spending with our immediate family and socializing with friends virtually. So there have been some silver linings in this remote work from home period of time. However, employees who are working remotely right now and especially employees with kids unsurprisingly are feeling especially unproductive due to distraction, not only more distraction at work but also as a result of additional distraction in our personal lives as we're working and living in the same personal space. I'm reminded of this as I'm giving a talk in my storage closet, which has now been converted into my home office, and I'm sure many of you feel the same. There's not that clear demarcation between work and life that we've all were accustomed to when we're going into the office regularly, at least for those who are working from home. Now, distraction is a major challenge. And again, we see that employed individuals with kids living at home are especially likely to feel distracted, creating this feeling that we can never get enough things done in a day, these feelings of engaging in more unproductive versus productive work. And on top of additional work uh, distraction, we're also completing more household chores and necessities than we did pre-pandemic. Women overall are unsurprisingly disproportionately affected. Um, and so we see in our data, if we extrapolated our data out to the next calendar year, so for 2021, we would see from our globally representative surveys that women would have about 12 more days of chores. Uh, employed women would spend about 12 more calendar days engaged in chores as compared to employed men. And they would have 3% less time engaging in active leisure activities like going outside, exercising, or socializing, volunteering as compared to employed men. And as I've already mentioned, time poverty can undermine happiness even pre-pandemic. Um, and time poverty is driven by a couple of societal norms and expectations that are helpful to be aware of. It's not just our, our, our own personal challenge. Time management is not a uniquely individual phenomena, but also a societal one. So the autonomy paradox is this ironic idea that uh, while our technology was supposed to free us from the office, we now take our office everywhere we go. And so this creates this, um, this cycle of constant responsivity in the workplace that we all feel that we must constantly respond to all of the pings and disruptions that come our way, leading to this feeling of time stress and distraction I was just mentioning. There's also a sense in our organizations as work has moved from being more objective. So can't, you can think of working in a factory and having objective outputs. Work has become less objectively able to tra be tracked over time. Our work is more likely to be knowledge work today than in prior um, experiences. And so this creates this ideal worker norm where organizations use constant responsivity as a proxy for commitment. So if you feel like you're always have under this pressure to constantly respond, Part of it is driven by the fact that organizations and managers use constant responsivity as a proxy for commitment, not necessarily quality of work as quality of work has become harder to define and organize across time. Now these feelings of needing to be constantly responsive 
create one of the key factors that caused time poverty, this idea of time confetti. So time confetti was a coined term by Bridget Schultz, whose work is amazing in this area, which, where we, which is the idea that we used to have one hour after dinner to engage in quality time with our friends and family, for example, between seven and eight after dinner, all the dishes were put away. And now that same one hour amount of time has been distracted distracted and disrupted into small amounts of leisure that's easily squandered and lost. So every time we get an alert, an alert on our phone or on our computer and we check it, that of course reduces the amount of leisure time that we have available, but it also creates the psychological feeling of goal conflict. If you are trying to enjoy a Saturday afternoon at a science museum with your kids or on a walk at the park with your partner, and you check a work alert on your phone, this pulls you out of the present and into all of the things you could or should be doing related to your never ending to do list. And this creates goal conflict, which in turn produces these feelings of time poverty. So the very first step of becoming time smart, reclaiming your time, living, trying to live a happier life, even in this challenging moment we find ourselves in, is to recognize and try to overcome in your own personal life these time traps with which I and others have identified in our research. So one time trap that I talk a lot about and which I'll provide some strategies for later on in this talk is this idea of undervaluing time. So we often underinvest in time. Time is amorphous, it's hard to track. It's certainly much harder to track than money. A loss of money if we get double charged at our favorite coffee shop feels viscerally uncomfortable. We're like, oh, I can't believe that I got double charged for that latte. But when it comes to missing out on half an hour here and there, we're less careful and we feel those time costs less viscerally. So as a result of this, because time is harder to track than money, we are often undervaluing or under investing in our time, even at the expense of saving relatively low amounts of money. Um, so the average American, for example, spends about two to three hours researching a consumer purchase um, of under $100. And so we make a lot of consumer purchases in our everyday life. And some of those purchases we should definitely recognize um, as something we want to come up with the cheapest and best option. However, for, uh, when we're making the difference perhaps between uh, two different kinds of toothpaste uh, that are 20 or 30 cents different from each other, we might want to be very cautious about how much time we invest researching for the best deal. Another trap that's related to these ideal worker norms I was just talking about is this idea as, of busyness as a status symbol. So especially in North American work culture, we stay busy to appear important and we actually give credibility to people who seem like they never have free time. When studies were run in Europe, such as in Italy, the norm is actually reversed. So in European cultures who tend to prioritize time and leisure um, to a greater degree than in North American contexts and in US contexts, people who have a lot of free time are actually conferred a higher status. So we wanna really be checking in with ourselves and thinking, well, when am I trying to appear busy and connected, but I'm not actually being productive? And is this a useful um, way to be spending my time? Or can I truly disconnect and uh, engage in other activities that might be more likely to promote happiness? We also experience idleness aversion as a result of this busyness as status symbol mentality that we have, especially in North American cultural context. This is the idea that we're often uncomfortable with stillness. One of my colleagues, Dan Gilbert at Harvard University ran an experiment with college students where he randomly assigned some college students to be able to have their phone in a room um, and just kind of wait out a 30 minute waiting period. And another group, they had all their technological devices taken away and they were left alone in a room with only their thoughts. Um, when left to their own devices, college students would rather give themselves mild electric shocks than be left with nothing to do. And this is one of the most striking examples of idleness aversion and there's been many others documented even working adults who are very busy and show up as the most time poor in my data worry about taking time off because they're not quite sure what they would do with that additional free time. Um, another psychologically informed time trap that I've observed in my data is this idea of the yes damn effect. So we often overcommit our future time given that we succumb to the planning fallacy. We think we'll have more time tomorrow than we do today in part because our future calendars seem open um, and 
expansive, whereas our schedules today are very busy. So we want to make sure when we're saying yes to something that we could say yes to it today. If we couldn't say yes to it today, we're probably not going to have more time in two, two weeks or two months. So one thing that we can all do is become aware of when we engage in the yes damn effect and overcommit our future time. We've already talked a lot about how technology can undermine our enjoyment of our leisure and fragment our leisure into small units of free time that easily get squandered and lost. And we also engage in something called the mere urgency effect. So especially when we're feeling busy, we're likely to prioritize the urgent as opposed to important tasks on our calendar. Um, this is because Completing small urgent tasks on our agenda can make us feel like we're getting something done. However, it often comes at the cost of working on important tasks at work. So this is one of the psychological explanations for why your inbox goes to zero when you have a major deadline, or at least mine does. Um, and that's because you're working on these lower level tasks as opposed to working on the more major tasks. So I want everyone to take a second to um, think a little bit about the traps that they fall into, why they think they might fall into them, and think a little bit in the chat window about whether there's any ideas that come to mind for them to help um, overcome some of these time traps that you might uh, find yourself in. I definitely engage in overscheduling as well. <laughs> Um, and it is, again, very important as one of the uh, one of the strategies for reclaiming time and taking ownership um, over our schedules is um, to notice this and not to be too hard on ourselves. We have to be self-compassionate. Um, and I know I also fall into the technology trap and I try really hard to put my phone away. I've seen a couple of um, comments in the chat window. So I will be talking for about um, another 20 minutes and then we will open the floor to question and answers uh, Q&A section so everyone will have a chance to, to chime in. So I am a social psychologist by training and so I don't want to just leave this talk kind of identifying a bunch of traps and why society and organizational factors make it difficult for us to prioritize time without giving us all some simple solutions that we can try to put into practice in our everyday lives to reclaim time and live a happier life. Ed Diener is one of my favorite psychologists. He pioneered the scientific study of happiness. And he says probably the biggest insight is that happiness is not just a place, it's a process. It's an ongoing process of fresh challenges and it takes the right attitudes and activities to continue to be happy. I think that this means that you can um, all we can all there's a lot of our happiness that's under our own control and so there's a lot we can do around the margins in our daily lives to live a happier life. I'm going to prevent present rather four scientifically based strategies for reclaiming time despite all of these um, you know factors that get in the way from us really focusing and prioritizing on leisure and being efficient at work. So I'm going to go through these four strategies relatively quickly and then leave some time for Q&A. So the first strategy that I've done a lot of research on is this idea of cultivating a time first mindset. So this is making decisions in the context of minor and major life decisions like consumer purchases and career decisions to put time first, to really see time for the precious and valuable resource that it is. To assess the extent to which there are individual differences in whether people prioritize time, over money or money over time, I ask people a really simple single item question. Are you more like Tina or more like Maggie? I gender balance these items. This is simply an example. So Tina values her time more than her money. She's willing to sacrifice money to have more time. Maggie values money more than time and she's willing to sacrifice her time to have more money. What I found over and over again in my data is that individuals who are more like Tina, who say they're more willing to give up money to have more time, do report greater happiness. This isn't driven by income, so there's no relationship um, uh, by income in terms of what people value. We do get slightly better at um, valuing time as we age. So this is consistent with Laura Carsonson's research and socio-selectivity theory. As we become older, we focus more on meaning and purpose. We're also more financially secure. So it's worth noting that 
Um, we're more likely to value money if we're uncertain about our financial futures. So during the uh, current economic situation that we're in, it's very normal for us to maybe make most of our decisions with more of a money focus. And there's nothing wrong with this, um, but it is worth noting and considering and contemplating whether you're someone who sacrifices money to have more time or sacrifices time to have more money. So this is a, a point where I want everyone to kind of think about, well, when do you value money? This isn't a dichotomy. We kind of all fall in a spectrum. Some of us make more of our minor life decisions, more with time in mind. I know that's true for me, but maybe they make more of their major life decisions like career or moving more uh, based on financial considerations. Um, and so it's important to think for yourself, when do you value money? Is it always optimal? Are you making career decisions more with time or money in mind? Um, and, you know, do you, when we used to travel, did you pay more for direct flights or not? Do you spend a lot of time researching for the best deals? I think it's important for all of us to recognize when uh, our values and our actions are consistent and when they're inconsistent, and then try to come up with strategies in the context of our everyday lives to overcome them. So as I mentioned, these, this time first mindset predicts happiness. Um, in my data, about 60%, this is a nationally representative sample of Americans have replicated this all over the world, um, do seem to put time first as opposed to money. Um, and they also tend to make a little bit more money, but work fewer hours. So there's a sense that they might be more efficient at work and they tend to be more intrinsically motivated at their jobs. Um, one reason that people who value time over money report greater happiness is that they spend fewer hours a week working and spend more time volunteering in their community, which is a very reliable predictor of happiness. They're also more civically engaged. And really importantly, and I think this is some of the most compelling behavioral data I have on this question, is we see that individuals who value time over money are more likely to invest in small social interactions on an everyday basis. So what we see is that individuals who value time over money, we, we tracked this value three months before students came into the lab, then we surreptitiously monitored their socialization behavior when they came into the lab. So students didn't know we were watching them and we saw, did students' values predict their social interactions with a peer in the lab in a context where they had never met this um, student before? And we see that students who value time over money were less efficient with their time. And this resulted in them spending about 18% more time socializing with a peer that they had never met. And weak tie interactions, which have gone missing in the COVID environment, are a really critical predictor of happiness. In one of my colleagues' surveys, we see that weak tie interactions um, predict happiness to the same extent as socializing with someone that you know really well. And in the workplace, these weak tie interactions are a great source of creativity and productivity. So really importantly, we need to leave space in our calendars to find time to interact socially. And so one reason that people who value time over money are happier, they are a little bit less kind of efficient, see focused and productivity focused, which leaves more time in their calendar for brief and formal interactions and time with friends and family. Last point on this, we also see that Students who valued time over money before graduation reported choosing jobs for more intrinsically satisfying reasons two to three years later, which in turn predicted their happiness. This is some of the strongest data suggesting that cultivating a time first mindset can almost causally predict the extent to which we experience gains in happiness after a major life transition. All, all this to say, it is okay to be money focused. After years of graduate school, I have more productivity and financially focused. Um, but there are many other decisions we can make on an everyday basis to reclaim time and live a happier life without fundamentally trying to change our mindset in life. Although it is important to be aware of what our default mindset is in the context of our everyday decision making. So the second strategy is this idea of finding time. So you should, in addition to reflecting on what you typically, your default mindset is when it comes to valuing time or money, you should also contemplate um, how you spend time on an everyday basis or engage in what I like to call a time audit. So it's, date, um, it's scientists call this the day reconstruction method. You want to think about the activities you do in the morning, the afternoon, and in the evening, and ask yourself which of those activities were productive or unproductive, and which of those activities were relaxing or stressful. So we wanna be thinking about eliminating activities that fall in the stressful and unproductive bucket, like constantly checking our email um, and maximizing the amount of time we spend in productive and relaxing activities um, or productive and stressful activities. Sometimes uh, 
uh, achieving personally important goals like writing a grant proposal or training for a half marathon doesn't necessarily feel good at the time, but it can be helping us achieve our goals. And when we do observe behaviors that fall or activities rather that fall in the stressful or unproductive category, we have to ask ourselves, can we get rid of them? Can we minimize them? So we wanna be thinking about maximizing the amount of time we spend in positive, productive, meaningful activities and minimizing the amount of time that we spend in unproductive activities. And again, I mentioned we're more likely to take on activities in this bottom left-hand quadrant when we're feeling stressed out. So we should be especially attentive to the near urgency effect when we're feeling stressed and we might be more likely to take on smaller, more stressful, unproductive activities when we're feeling stressed out. So this is a perfect example. This was one of my students uh, tweeted this uh, right before giving this talk and I thought it was a good illustration of this near urgency effect idea. So my student writes, oh, this task is going to take forever. Got to block off a lot of time to get it done. One month later, oh, time to finally start this. Ugh. Five minutes later, that was easy. <laughs> so we often put off things that we feel are hard, especially if we're busy. Um, and sometimes these tasks don't even take as long as we think they're going to. Another way that we can find time in our schedule is to put proactive blocks of time in our calendar to work on important but not necessarily urgent work. This is sometimes known in the time management literature as the 30-30 rule. Here, we actually use two hour blocks of time as opposed to 30 minute blocks of time. The 30-30 rule is this idea you wanna spend 30 minutes each day working on an activity that's not gonna pay off for 30 days or more, like working on a resume or learning a new skill. You can think about these proactive blocks of time in a similar way. So we ran an experiment with a set of busy executives and we asked them to put two hour blocks of time in their schedule each day where they would turn off their technology and their teams knew about it so they wouldn't get distracted during this time and to work on important but not necessarily urgent work. After six weeks of scheduling uninterrupted time for important but not urgent tasks, employees reported 14% more efficiency and 20% um, less burnt out at the end of the study. Um, it's also important to note that these teams had a planning block in their schedule. So it's you need to make sure you know what you're gonna do when you get to these blocks of time. So a 30 minute planning block can really help set implementations for what you're going to do with these blocks of time that you're putting in your schedule. I would be not a very good time management researcher if I didn't have something to say about saying no. Of course, one way to get more time in your schedule is to overcome the yes damn effect and your uh, want inclination to want to say yes to everything, thinking you'll have more time tomorrow, which we all do, and I'm definitely guilty of. But in our research, we didn't just focus on the benefits of saying no, we also focus on exactly how you should say no. So what we observe in our data is out of all of these options, I'd be curious if people have um, any thoughts of which one would work the best um, quickly before I reveal the results. So um, do people think that the time, money, energy, or no excuse would uh, be pretty um, effective? So a little bit uh, of a mix, but people are definitely on to something. So what I have observed in my data is that time-related excuses are actually the worst way to decline an invitation, especially for a social event. We all have 24 hours in a day, and so time-related excuses can make the other person think you don't wanna do whatever it is that they're asking. Money or energy-related excuses are more externally attributed, so the person doesn't take it as personally um, when you decline an event. And if those are just simply not true, you feel fine and you have the money to do whatever someone is asking you, um, no excuse is actually a powerful way to decline an invitation, as many of you already indicated in the chat window. The third strategy for reclaiming time and reducing stress is funding time. So again, we want to be thinking about maximizing the amount of time we spend in positive activities and minimizing the amount of time we spend in negative activities. And one way to do this is to fund time to outsource our dislike tasks to others or give up some of our discretionary income to have more and better time. So I've run surveys all over the world looking at whether people outsource, spend money to save time or to spend money to outsource dislike tasks to others. I've run these studies um, both in Europe, Canada, US, but also in uh, Kenya among small scale uh, entrepreneurs. And we see that in general, when people are outsourcing, delegating, spending some of their financial resources to um, save themselves time, this predicts greater life satisfaction in part by reducing these feelings of time stress and goal conflict. 
It doesn't take much money. So as little as $40 is enough to see the happiness benefits in one experiment. I randomly assigned working adults to receive a $40 um, payment to save themselves time on one weekend versus a $40 payment on another weekend where they received 40 bucks to spend on a material purchase for themselves. I found that at the end of the day, people who spent money to save time reported greater happiness, in part because they were spending that free time with friends or family. So they were um, getting takeout and then spending that quality time together with their friends and family. My students have bought used bikes instead of um, walking to the office. Um, to save themselves time or an automatic coffee machine which brews coffee in the morning and is an alarm clock so that my student didn't have to fumble around in the dark as they explained it to brew themselves coffee. It was just brewed for them in the morning which saved them a few minutes uh, of stress and unpleasantness. Now it's also worth noting that a lot we all make time saving purchases in the context of our everyday life but it's actually really important to think about those objects as a way to save time. We've done some research on autonomous products in the last few months, and we actually see that autonomous products don't necessarily predict happiness unless you see them as a product that saves time. So when it comes to making time-saving purchases, we really wanna be thinking about that as a time-saving purchase, and then reallocating some of the time that we're saving on more enjoyable or meaningful experiences. During the COVID pandemic, we've seen that time-saving purchases are particularly positive, uh, provide a particularly positive boost to relationship satisfaction. So we've asked uh, couples at all levels of the income spectrum to report whether they make time-saving purchases together and then to report on their relationship satisfaction. We've also done daily diary surveys where we're looking at, or weekly diary surveys where we're looking at on weeks where couples make purchases, do they experience greater relationship satisfaction? And we show that they do. Um, one caveat here is that you wanna be making sure you make these decisions together as a couple. So in context where one partner is buying a time-saving purchase as a gift for another partner, this doesn't always work out positively. It explains why my uh, parents used to fight a lot over the holiday season. My dad would gift my mom a house cleaning service and my mom wished he would just do more around the house. And that gift actually highlighted the chore discrepancy between them. So you wanna make sure when you're trying to implement this in the context of romantic relationships that you make these decisions together with your romantic partner. The last strategy that I'll talk about is this idea of reframing time. So reframing time is that there's going to be some things that fall in that left-hand quadrant that feel stressful, that are unpleasant, that we can't get out of. Um, and there is some really good scientific research suggesting we can reframe these activities um, in order to feel a greater sense of satisfaction and less stress. In the context of the workplace, uh, my, my PhD student, Jay Wan Yoon, who just graduated, has a, a set of research experiments showing that when we're working on tasks like budgeting or finance or data entry that don't feel very uh, pleasant in and of themselves at work, if we think about how our task helps our colleagues get their work done, even this simple reframing to think about how our work builds on others towards a broader goal can help to reduce some of the stress on working, uh, the stress of working on mundane and sort of stressful, seemingly unimportant tasks at work. We can also import this strategy in the context of our personal life. Um, so we can treat the weekend like a vacation. So my colleagues have a great paper showing this simple reframing strategy of just thinking about our upcoming weekend, not like a regular weekend, but like a holiday actually helps curtail our use of technology during the weekend. So we feel more present in the moment and then get more satisfaction out of our weekends as opposed to when we're just treating the weekend like a regular weekend. Now, when we do find ourselves with free time, we should also be mindful of how we wanna spend it. So I'm gonna go back to these slides that I skipped just for a moment on this uh, with a set of studies that we did um, looking at time use differences and well-being among some of the world's wealthiest as compared to a representative sample. So we went to the Netherlands where there's actually quite a lot of equality in um, income and we observed a group of high net worth individuals and a representative sample. And we found that there was a, a difference in life satisfaction such that higher income individuals in the sample reported greater overall life satisfaction, but that this didn't have to do with how they were spending their money. In fact, the wealthier individuals in this sample reported greater active leisure. They spent about 30 minutes more each day 
engaged in exercise, volunteering, or socializing, whereas a representative sample spent about 40 uh, minutes more engaged in passive leisure, like relaxing and resting, and that these time use differences were the ones that in fact predicted differences in life satisfaction and happiness. Now, there is something to say that the autonomy we experience in our workplaces is partially responsible for these differences in active leisure, such that representative samples have less autonomy over how they spend their time on an everyday basis. So at the end of the workday, they feel more tired and less invigorated, um, which might account for why they're engaging in less active leisure at the end of the day. So this is again, another point that it's not just up to individuals, workplaces also have a lot to do with how we spend our time on an everyday basis. Now, a bonus strategy is that we should really reflect on what quality time and positive uses of time mean to us. My economist colleagues always ask if I could put, since I have so much data on this question, if I could just come up with an equation for a perfect day for the average person. Um, and unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that. For some people, laundry is a time where they meditate. For others, it's torture. Um, and so we all have different meanings that we uh, put forward to each of our activities in a day. So it's really important that we all reflect on what quality time means to us. And in my data, regardless of the activity, when people think about quality time, they're thinking about activities where they feel supported, where they feel that they're in a positive mood and that they're present in the moment. So we wanna be thinking about maximizing the amount of time that we spend in activities that help us connect with those around us, put us in a good mood and allow us to be present in the moment. Workplaces and our work lives are also impeding, infringing on our time affluence right now, as I mentioned at the outside of the talk. Um, so five simple strategies we can all take if we find ourselves working remotely and can go a long way in terms of time affluence and happiness are as follows. We wanna be thinking about creating our own commute. I saw this in the chat window actually. And so Microsoft uh, I put virtual commutes in their employees calendars so that they couldn't put meetings in the time that they used to spend commuting and encouraged instead their employees to go for a run around the block or to connect with their families during that eight to nine period or five to six period instead where they used to have virtual commutes. So make sure to set breaks, boundaries and transitions in your virtual workday if you are working remotely. This can go a long way in helping you feel like you have more control over your schedule. An end of day ritual is also super important. You wanna think about scheduling an exercise activity or social interaction or cooking a new meal or a delicious dinner that you're gonna heat up that's in your fridge. Anything that gives a clear demarcation to the end of the workday is especially important right now. and gives you the opportunity to celebrate the success that you've had during the day. It's even more important now than ever because of all this digital distraction to put daily must wins on your calendar and to put proactive time in your calendar. And I did see someone in the chat window mentioning that they're rethinking work structures and now is a perfect opportunity to experiment individually and on your team with different work structures. In an HBR we wrote, we talked about one of my colleagues rechanging their work structures. So they spent three days in the office for that creative collaborative time, those informal hallway interactions that are more or less gone missing during COVID, two days working from home so they, the employees could get more of their kind of big rock tasks done, and then two days off where they would spend with friends and family, and that those days were kind of scattered throughout the week as on a week-to-week -week basis. This 322 is just one idea out of many. Some workplaces are going to four-day work weeks. Some are doing uh, control and uh, risk, like, it's up to you. You have control of your schedule, um, so you can work wherever and how many days in the office that you want. And I think there's a lot of potentially interesting experiments with regard to rethinking work structures that because we're re really creating our new normal as we go, that there's a lot of opportunity to test out what works best for you and your teams. And the last note I wanna end on um, before opening up to questions is just a reminder that focusing on time is not selfish. I often get the pushback in my data, especially right now with all of the challenges going on in the world and the financial situation all over in the global economy that um, individuals say, um, I'll focus on time when I win the lottery. My students say, I'll focus on time when I get this promotion or obtain this next job. And I wanna caution against this if then thinking because our reference points change. So if we do get that next promotion or a next job, um, you know, we all are going to set a new goal for ourselves. So by engaging in yes, if 
if then thinking, we might not actually ever uh, achieve our time affluence or other personal goals. So if there's something you want to do right now, um, the best time to do it um, and to put it into your calendar is today. Cleo Wade is a poet and author who has a lot to say on the topic of self-compassion. And one quote that I like a lot speaking to this idea of time is pro-social um, is we take care of ourselves by lightening up and not being so hard on ourselves. At times life seems to be one never ending to-do list, but we must learn to disrupt the flood of life's demands to replenish our energy so we can fully show up for all of our passions and responsibilities. In my data, people who put time first, spend more time with their friends and family, volunteer more and exercise more, they're better, um, they're less burnt out, so they're better able to be fully present for the causes and for the people they care about. So even reminding ourselves that time is for social in my data can encourage all of us to put time first in our everyday lives, no matter what's going on for us. And of course, focusing on time is not only up to individuals. Organizational strategies like setting up formal processes to allow um, employees to ask for more time, which is what we did in one of these experiments here, can also help to empower individuals to take control of their time, to ask for time as a critical resource at work, ask for deadline extensions, and to take the time they need. So it isn't, uh, time poverty is not just an individual phenomenon, it's very much driven by our organizations and our cultural context. So it's up to all of us together as individuals in our personal lives, as employees, as leaders, at work and beyond to set up structures and organizational policies that will allow employees to thrive and take control of their time. So with that, um, I uh, just mentioned that this is an HBR article that I wrote that outlines some of these ideas as well as in my book. And this is the academic literature underpinning some of our conversation today, which has been conducted with so many wonderful colleagues um, and it's been a very meaningful use of my time over the last several years. So I'm looking forward to all of your questions and comments and a meaningful discussion over the next 15 minutes or so. Wonderful, Ashley, thank you so much. It's such an interesting presentation and we have a number of great questions. We'll do our best uh, to capture as many of them as possible in this limited time. Uh, but it seems that there are a number of questions related to the pandemic. And when you say, uh, you know, that investing in small socializations are uh, very important interactions that add to happiness, do virtual interactions have that same value, Ashley? Yeah, so we've been doing some qualitative um, uh, research with a large management consulting team to look at what are the kinds of activities uh, knowledge workers need in a fully remote environment and what does that look like in virtual as compared to co-located. What we are seeing is that these informal social interactions seem to go missing more easily in the virtual environment. Meetings will run back to back. We won't leave natural breaks, boundaries, transitions that appear in our workday. Um, and so it's even more important than ever to leave breaks in between meetings so people can not only have um, breaks to eat um, and to deal with personal concerns, but also so that they can interact informally with colleagues. So that's one observation in terms is just that uh, on the quantity perspective, they just don't exist to the same frequency. So we need to be more proactive in building opportunities for social interaction in. Now, in terms of the quality perspective, this is something we're currently running field experiments on right now in companies, but the general sense is that longer forced team social interactions can be more tiring than helpful. So um, long Zoom meetings and uh, team building exercises are good, but you don't want to do them too often so that they're actually burning out teams since we are spending so much time on virtual right now. So if there's a kind of an activity that's sort of fun and low lift that involves a tactical component that's optional, um, and even leaving time for shorter and more frequent just hangouts, I think is is what we've been observing in the data are slightly more effective from a quality perspective. Definitely the interviewees we've been talking to say that it's not as effective, um, but I think that's also because some of the interactions they've been having are really long virtual happy hours where people sort of feel trapped on the call and it's not that fun. So you wanna be thinking about short, informal, fun, maybe a bit spontaneous interactions in the virtual environment. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question related to procrastination. Um, time off or freedom of topic of study is an overcommitted subject. 
Uh, she wonders if, uh, if you have any advice for procrastination, how to overcome it, especially if the pandemic has made that more of an issue for you. Yeah, so this is a great question. I would say you want to, um, I think I have in my data, <laughs> yes, implementation intention. So as we're listening to the Q&A here, everyone can write down an implementation intention of something that they heard, a strategy that this talk reminded them or the chat it reminded them of, and write it in the chat window to hold yourself accountable to following through. Uh, something you can do today um, to live a kind of more time mindful, time smart life, if you will. Um, but more broad, so everyone should do this during the Q and A period in our in our 15 minutes uh, remaining or so. Um, but more broadly, implementation intentions can help write down what, how, when you're going to do something. You saw that a little bit in my proactive um, time blocking slide with all with the planning block being as critical as the actual blocks of time themselves. Um, I would also resist the urge to work on low level stuff first before your kind of more big rock type work. Um, a new paper by one of my colleagues, Juliana Schroeder at Berkeley just came out showing you wanna eat the frog first is what the cute title of the paper is called. Um, so even though we believe that working on smaller tasks will help us kind of build up momentum to get to that harder thing, actually um, it's not as effective. So you really wanna tackle the first thing that you have on your agenda at the beginning of the day um, and then leave everything else after. And if you can also play on this um, fact that we don't like feeling like our goals are going unfinished. So open the document of the thing that you need to work on at the end of the day. And so it's the very first thing you see and that uh, famous writers have like left a, a, a manuscript to have like with a sentence unfinished because it gives us this sense of wanting to complete the sentence. So anything you can do to help motivate yourself um, in that way can also be effective. Great, uh, we have a great question related to the notion of multitasking. Uh, can you say something about the value or non-value of this notion of multitasking? I would say that the best research suggests that multitasking is um, likely to not produce efficient outcomes. So there's been some great research suggesting that toggling back and forth creates attentional residue, um, meaning you're now doing one activity, but your mind is still in another activity um, that can undermine cognitive performance. So you're going to spend longer iterating because you're trying to toggle back and forth between multiple tasks. This also is true when it comes to scheduling. So we don't want to schedule our meetings too tightly um, back to back because as soon as the upcoming meeting uh, starts to come close in time to whatever meeting we're in, we're no longer present in the moment. We're not paying as much attention to something. And now our mind is out of the present into the next meeting. This happens even with leisure. Um, so it's not just multitasking, but also how we schedule our work and personal lives that can make a difference when it comes to working memory and cognitive performance. Absolutely, I did see a comment in chat related to sharing this presentation with children. And we have a great question that asks, uh, how to encourage idleness, uh, especially in children? Uh, this uh, gentleman, Ariel Gamino in Texas, uh, feels that part of growing up is learning to have time to daydream and electronics make that very difficult. But do you have any advice for those with young children? Uh, this is a great question. Um, I know there's been some research out of Europe um, in Scandinavian countries on the importance of unstructured play. Um, so I would make sure that um, I think idleness might look different for a young child uh, as it does uh, to us who maybe are more um, happy to sit with a journal and sort of or meditate completely. So maybe if you set up a technology free room and allow for unstructured play outside, I think this could be a really positive sense of idleness. And I do think that's really important. And there's been some research suggesting it's very important for child development to allow for unstructured, um, non-technologically mediated playtime. Yes, and can you speak a little bit more about idleness? Uh, there seem to be a number of questions and comments that people feel that they're being unproductive and that they're wasting time when yeah. they're idle. So unfortunately, um, this is something that has been culturally ingrained. Uh, we have a paper on this related to the Protestant work ethic. Um, so this idea that leisure is lazy, that every minute idle is a minute wasted. And that's much higher in North American cultural context than there's even regional variability. And actually the extent to which, um, if you're feeling this way, you're not alone. We see in our data that if you live in an area that has high historical levels of Protestant work ethic, um, or 
where everyone around you works more than the national average, you enjoy leisure less and there's less of a link between stress and unhappiness. Um, so we're kind of culturally told that leisure is not legitimate and that it's lazy. Um, so one way that we might be able to overcome idleness aversion is to think about leisure as a productive use of time um, that will help us be more productive when we are at work. It is a difficult, um, uh, you know, this it's a difficult notion to wrap our heads around given that we're so uh, indoctrinated to put work first, but it is a really important practice. And I think mindfulness, resilience training are also effective strategies to help us all be more comfortable with being in the present moment without an agenda. Great. Can you elaborate just a bit more on uh, your mention of pro time? And I know it is a part of your book, but people are looking for just a little bit more if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, sure. So in this pro time intervention, we implemented it in the context of a busy um, knowledge work organization, more among uh, managers and executives, but we eventually rolled it out to their teams too. It was a very simple intervention. We said, you, everyone on this uh, team is going to need to put one 30 minute planning block in their schedule and then two subsequent two hour blocks of time where they wouldn't check their phone or email, they wouldn't take a meeting and they would work on something that was on their desk that was important but not urgent. So, so for some of our participants, this might've been learning and development opportunities that their company offered but they felt like they never had time to do. For others, this might've been writing or data analysis, stuff that is the central uh, linchpin of their work, but they feel like they never have time for. And I think a couple of really important reasons why this worked is we had that 30 minute planning block, but also the entire team was on board. So of course, uh, an individual pro time block in the middle of a workday is not going to work if your manager feels like they can call you at any time <laughs> um, and ask for your opinion and you feel obliged to pick up and talk with them regardless of what you're doing. So I think a lot of the success of time management practices such as proactive time like we've implemented in various workplace contexts comes from setting positive team norms. So we started to move these workplace interventions beyond the level of the individual to really focus on the collective level. Um, so teams are setting norms among themselves around when they're going to start the work day, when they're going to end, how late the last meeting can be, when their breaks in the day are going to be for lunch, and so on. And the more coordinated our calendars are, especially in the context of virtual work, the more we're going to have control and predictability over our schedules. Absolutely. Uh, there are a number of questions and comments related to technology interventions, such as virtual assistance and automation as being key to saving time or apps perhaps. Um, do you recommend any of these strategies? Yeah, so definitely <laughs> we want to not rely on willpower to the same extent as we, we typically do. So my PhD student, Ariella Cristal, has a whole set of really interesting projects um, showing that we kind of rely too much on our willpower and not enough on external constraints to help us accomplish personally important goals like turning up for technology. So this is a case for especially uh, if we want buy-in to pay money for an app that's gonna turn off the alerts on our phone. So there's been some fun technological innovations where um, you can set up a device in your living room so it automatically turns the Wi-Fi off on your whole family's phone. So you, you cannot uh, be on the internet during family dinner. I think the extent to which um, we rely, we should start to rely more on technology and the extent that we do is likely to increase our success and commitment even more than we expect. We all want to feel like we have the willpower to um, engage in some of these strategies ourselves, but really uh, the more we can rely on situational strategies that we're not relying on our own, in, uh, our own ability to turn off our phones, the more likely we are to follow through and, and really disconnect from our technology. Now related to individual strategies, did you make any lifestyle changes or adaptations because of the pandemic or changes made to just due to your own research findings and the way that you conducted your time? Yeah, so um, I think that I, I, get, I do get asked this question quite a bit. I think I'm a lot more clear now um, around work and non-work. Um, so I kind of used to let work bleed into all of the time. I would, like work just fills to expand the time you give it. So you give it all the time and it'll take all the time that you give it. Um, so I have much more clear demarcation around weekends and weekdays than I used to. I'm really conscious of how 
my email behavior might be affecting my team. So I'm quite guilty of my, my partner is an ER physician, works very weird hours. I'm quite guilty of, you know, working on taking a weekday off because then we have a coordinated day off and then working on the weekend and then not really fully thinking about how that might be impacting my team or my colleagues who think then that they have to be working all weekend. So I now use the boomerang feature on my email, my Outlook, uh, and schedule my email. So even if I'm working on the weekend, it's not going to show up until Monday at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., whatever is more uh, socially appropriate. So that's one thing. I've also tried to disrupt my morning habit. I used to kind of like roll out of bed, go straight to the computer, which is so tempting. The virtual commute is something I'm really trying to stick with. I try to not check email and not work for the first half an hour of a day. I'm not always successful, but this habit disruption is really, really critical. Love that virtual commute idea. Um, now, they would love a little bit more elaboration on what you consider a must win. Would you be able to explain that just a bit more? Yeah, I mean, this will look um, specific to whatever your work is, but we all know the things that we should be doing. Um, you know, picking one thing that you really want to get done that day and just defending your calendar so you can get it done. Maybe it won't get done in a day. Maybe it'll take a couple of days, um, but that's really what I mean. So for today, I have a talk that I need to write. That's my must win. So in all the blocks of time that I find myself with between meetings, I'm trying to get that done. I'm just driving toward um, getting that slide deck done as opposed to maybe like stopping and like checking email, like going back to it. I'm like, no, this talk must get done first. And then I can worry about all the other urgent but less important stuff on my calendar. That's just one specific example from today. Great. And a similar question related to what you consider proactive time. Proactive time, again, is something where you're not putting out fires. It's something that maybe is not critically urgent due today, or maybe it is. It's, some, it's um, something where you need a little bit of time and that you're likely to get distracted from. So my day today might be going better. For example, I might be further through my talk if I would have had a proactive block of time scheduled this morning, but you know, it's, we're new in the semester and my days have been filled with meetings. So I wasn't good about this, but if I would have had that two hour proactive block of time this morning, then I'd be further through my presentation today. Um, so that proactive block of time would have given me more space to work on the larger project that I had available or my must win. So those strategies really go hand in hand. Great, and on that note, we have a number of students joining us today who wonder if you can offer any advice to a student who is attending classes virtually and otherwise uh, feeling very isolated. Yeah, so I would say be, uh, be proactive in reaching out and forming online study groups. A lot of my, what I've been observing, something that I've been seeing my PhD students do, which I completely love and think is a great idea, is they'll have virtual work sessions and mirror being in a library together. They're not talking, they might have some ambient music on in the background and they're just getting their work done together. It simulates being in a coffee shop that's sort of like be you know, a positive experience. Some of our, our teams uh, in the management consulting realm have had virtual team rooms, which are really fun. So if you're studying for final exams, you could set up a virtual study room and people could go in and out of that and ask each other questions to again, create an opportunity for these informal social interactions. That's an awesome idea. Uh, we are getting close to running out of time. So Ashley, is there any uh, final words that you would like to depart or any advice? I would say everyone should definitely make an implementation intention right now um, and uh, really just be mindful of the way they're spending time on an everyday basis. There's so much happiness we can get from just simply changing the way we spend the next 30 minutes. Um, so I really hope uh, everyone feels in empowered to spend 30 minutes differently today, tomorrow, and next week to feel a greater sense of control over their schedule and greater happiness. Wonderful. Well, thank you so very much, Ashley. This was fascinating and I already have my own list uh, growing that I need to work on and I hope you all had some great takeaways. Um, just a reminder that we did record today's session. So if you joined late, have no fear. We will share this recording by email as well as on the Harvard Extension School's YouTube channel just as soon as it is fully cash captioned. So hang in. Um, otherwise, please join us at a virtual event that's coming. Follow our website and social media. And please do share any of your ideas for upcoming events. And we look forward to seeing you again virtually or hopefully just as soon as we are able in person. 
And in the meantime, uh, stay well, be healthy, and best wishes.